This is Jay, Moody, and Kai, and today we are searching for Makaro House. The video was shot in shaky cam, the footage hard to watch without getting a little seasick. Officer Wiley, Detective Wiley now, had seen a lot in his time on the force, but a double homicide perpetrated by this 14-year-old kid in front of him was something he hoped he would never see. A double homicide, and carried out against two of his best friends, at that. The two kids in question, Marshall Moody and Kai Dillon, had been friends with Jason Weeks since elementary school, and there had never been any reports of violence or any other alarming behavior, at least none reported to the police. The boys had operated a YouTube channel, JMK Occult, for the last two years, and while their content was pretty typical for kids online, they had been uploading steadily every week since their first video about a strange deer in the north woods around Catterley. Hell, Wiley even watched their stuff sometimes when he was bored. People in the community knew them, and this was out of character for any of them. Wiley paused the video, the three boys blundering through the south woods and chattering like a pack of squirrels, and looked at Jason. Jason, Jay to his friends, looked like he had aged a decade. He had a gaunt look usually reserved for soldiers who come back from war. His hair had been long and blonde for as long as anyone had known him, but the kid sitting here now was as bald as an egg and his scalp looked scoured instead of shaved. The shirt he had been wearing in the video was gone. He was still wearing the ring of it around his neck, the stretched fabric like a collar, and the jeans he wore were stained and ragged in places that looked fresh. He'd been found with no shoes or socks, but he was wearing the orange flip-flops of a jail resident now. Wiley knew his parents wanted to bail him out, but he wasn't sure if the judge was going to extend him bail or not, given the nature of his crime. The way those kids had been ripped apart was something that would haunt him for a long time. So, Jason, Officer Russell tells me that someone picked you up beside the road and you told them that your friends were dead and that you had killed them. Is that true? Jason nodded, not speaking a word as he continued to stare at the wall. The woman in question was Darla Hughes, a mother of three who had stopped when she saw a young teenage boy walking on the side of the road in the state he was currently in. Stories of kidnapping and kids held in basements for months while God knew what happened to them were clear in the public consciousness. Darla thought she had found some kid who had escaped his situation, and when she stopped to help him, she said the poor lamb had said eight words and then nothing else. He said, my friends are dead, and I killed them. They had found the kids in a clearing in the woods about three miles in, a site he was familiar with. How many times had he and his friends gone looking for the Makaro house? Everyone in Catterley knew about Makaro house, and most people's childhoods had been spent looking for it. John Makaro, a prominent figure in Catterley's history, had been a prominent importer and exporter in England. He had come to America before the Revolutionary War to try to set up a similar business here, and Catterley had been a large enough port to satisfy his needs without being so big that a new face would be lost. He established a manor in the South Woods, despite being told that it was Indian land, and the bill of sale did very little to dispatch the native tribe that was living there. 
he survived two raids by the natives somehow, but his wife and daughter were not so lucky the second time. As such, he rallied a mob of townspeople to go into the woods and help him flush out the natives who were living there. The raid took weeks, but by the end, they had killed or scattered every member of the tribe that lived there. Satisfied, Mr. Makaro built his lavish estates there, but strange things surrounded it from the first. Workers went missing, people reported strange lights and sounds after dark, and a shriveled figure in skins and feathers could be seen lurking after moonrise. Animals on the property acted strangely, and sometimes people found wolves or bears on the grounds. Usually, they were in a rage, but sometimes they simply fled as if they had been drawn there and weren't sure what to do now that they were. Once the house was finished, John Makaro had a hard time keeping staff. None of the hands he had hired to keep his livestock would stay more than a week, and they all refused to stay on the property after dark. His servants would likewise disappear suddenly, and none of them would stay at night besides his butler, who had been with him for years. People said that Mr. Makaro talked about hearing chanting in the house and seeing strange shadows, and when even his butler disappeared one evening, John locked the doors and stayed in the house alone for a long time. People who came to see him said he could be seen wandering the halls like a ghost, calling out for people only he could see. When his mansion was seen in full blaze one night, those who were first on the scene said they saw a lone man silhouetted in the flames, his feathers and skins on full display. He disappeared when they got close, but he had been seen by many in the years to come. What did you see out there, Jason? Jason continued to stare at the wall. I want to help you, kid but you have to help yourself first. He couldn't help but glance down at the kid's fingers as he left them splayed on that table like sleeping spiders. The nails were dirty, the beds crusty with something like blood, and several of them were torn and ragged. There was grime around his mouth too, and Wiley would have bet his next paycheck that it wasn't a Kool-Aid ring. It looked like mud or paint, but it was probably blood. Jason remained silent as the grave. Jason, none of us believe that you killed your friends. You. You're wrong. Wiley had been fiddling with the remote, trying not to look at the kid's hands, but when he spoke, he looked up. Jason was still staring at the wall, but his head was shaking as his teeth chattered together. The kid looked like he was staring into the mouth of hell instead of the cream-colored wall of the interrogation room. Wiley almost didn't want to ask him what he had seen, but he needed to know. He needed to know how this kid had killed two other kids one of whom was bigger than him by a head and 60 pounds. Would you like to elaborate? Wiley asked. He didn't think the kid would for a minute, but finally, he just reached slowly and pushed play on the remote. He kept looking at Wiley like he thought he might slap his hand, but when he let him get all the way across the table unsmacked, he relaxed a little. The video went on as they walked through the woods, joking and laughing as the woods lived their quiet existence around them. We went in at 8, just after Kai's mom went to work. She wouldn't have liked us going into the south woods, but we wanted to investigate Makaro House. We wanted to do it for our first episode, 
but Moody said it was something we should work up to. The Makaro house was something big, and we needed to be ready for it. Turned out we weren't. On the screen, the kids kept walking through the woods, checking their compass and making their way carefully through the thick brush. They were still chattering, talking about what they might find when they got there, and whether they would find the clearing or see the mysterious mansion that people talked about sometimes. Legend said that a ghostly manor appeared in the clearing sometimes, the ghost of the house and that people who went inside were never seen again. Wiley didn't believe that, but as a kid, he had to admit that the clearing where the house had sat was spooky. All the wood had long ago rotted, the stones taken away for use in other things, but the land just felt wrong. Wiley had never been there after dark, but people claimed to hear footsteps and see things after the sun went down. Wiley pushed fast forward on the tape and watched as the kids plodded on and on. Jason wished that he could have sped through that part of the trip. They had set out at 8, waving to Kai's mom as she pulled out of the driveway. The packs had been pulled out of the garage after she was down the road a piece, and the three set out for the woods. They knew the rough direction of the Makaro house, but no one really came upon it in the same way. Danny Foster had said it was a three-mile walk from the forest's edge to the property, but Jamie had claimed that he and his friends had walked for what seemed like hours. When we found it, though, he said, we found the house instead of an empty lot. We kept daring each other to go in, but we left when someone lit a fire on the grounds. Jason and his friends were hoping to find the house instead of the lot, and as their walk turned into a hike, Kai stopped and looked at the compass. We should have gotten there by now. Moody chuckled, maybe we're going in the wrong direction. Can't be. Kai protested, the directions are to go south into the south woods for three miles. Then you'll come to the clearing where Makaro House once Saturday. Jason didn't want to jinx it, but at the time he thought that boded well for them finding the house. They kept walking, Kai good for an endless stream of conversation, and as the sun began to set, Jason found he was out of breath. His tongue felt like leather as it stuck to the roof of his mouth, and the lunch they had brought had been eaten hours ago. Moody had argued that they should turn around and head back, but Jason had finally vocalized, wanted. When the sun began to go down, Wiley knit his brows together. I thought you and your friends were only in the woods for a few hours. Jason shook his head slowly, we were, and we weren't. The time on the camera says we walked for 8 hours before I turned it off, but when I got picked up by the side of the road, it was barely noon. Wiley pursed his lips, how is that possible? The video cut out the battery in the camera having been exhausted, and Jason nodded at the screen. Those batteries have a max life of three hours. Dad said it was the best battery they had when he ordered it for me, and it was pretty expensive. There's no way one of those batteries could have recorded for eight hours, but it did. The recording came back on, and Wiley was shocked to see that they were standing on the lawn of an old gothic mansion. The sun setting behind the house made a perfect backdrop for the shot, and the boys were oh-oh-oh-ing and agging appreciatively. None of them seemed to believe what they were seeing, 
the whole thing a little otherworldly, and there seemed to be some argument about who was going to approach the house first. Is that, Wiley stopped to wet his lips, it can't be. The Makaro house burned down hundreds of years ago. But there it is, Jason said, his eyes still fixed on the wall, in all its glory. And oh, what glory there had been in it. Moody had gawked at the house as he had never seen one before. No way, there is no way. That's impossible, Kai breathed, that house burned to the ground before our father's fathers were even thought of. But there it is, Jason said, mirroring his later statement, though he could not know it, in all its glory. As the sun set behind it, Jason thought it looked even spookier than it would at night. The mansion rose like an obelisk towards the sky, its towered roofs looking naked without flags or pinions. The boys stood at the edge, trying to shame or bluster one of the others into going there first, but in the end, Jason took the first step. The others looked surprised at his boldness, but they followed closely after, not wanting to be thought less of. Jason expected the house to disintegrate as he approached, an illusion or a trick of the light, but as his foot came to rest on the boards of the old house, he felt their solidity and continued to climb. When the doors opened for them, the broad double doors swinging jauntily on their hinges, the three boys pulled back as they prepared to run. The camera captured their indecision, the portal yawning wide as it waited to receive them, and Jason seemed to surprise even himself as he came forward to investigate it. Jason, what if it's a trap? This whole place shouldn't exist, and if you think I'm going to pass up the chance to explore it, you're wrong. Jason went in, pausing just inside the doors as if waiting for them to crash shut. When they didn't, Moody followed him and Kai brought up the rear. Makaro House lived up to its gothic exterior, the inside full of soft dark velvet and antique furniture. There was a fire burning in the hearth inside the sitting room, tables spread with books in the library, and as they came up the long hall that led towards what was undoubtedly a dining room, Jason began to smell something. It was something like a stew or maybe a roast, and the smell of meat brought them to the dining room. A long table sat in the middle, eight chairs on each side of it, and at the end sat a wrinkled old man eating soup from a bowl. It was hard to tell before they had gotten close, but the old man looked like he might be Native American. He was dressed in hides, feathers adorning his head and necklace, and he wore a beaded necklace with bones and claws on it. He looked up as they approached, glowering at them evenly, before returning to his meal. He ignored the boys, all three standing back apprehensively before Jason found the courage to speak. Excuse me, sir. Is this your house? The spoon froze on the way to his mouth, and the old man looked like he'd been slapped. My house, he asked, his voice sounding thin and whispery, no, child, but it was paid for by my people. We paid with our blood, we paid with our lives, and in the end, the cost was high. I took some of that cost from the previous owner of this home, and now it's only me who lives here. Kai made an uncomfortable noise in his throat, like a dog trying to tell its owner that something wasn't safe, and Jason understood the feeling. Well, 
we'll leave you to it then. We didn't mean to. Leave, the old man said, sounding amused. Oh no. No one leaves Makaro House until they've played the game. It was always a way for our warriors to test their mettle, and I have so longed to see it played again. Will you join me? If not, I'm afraid you might find it quite hard to leave. Moody took a step back, and Jason heard his heavy footsteps on the carpet as he tried to retreat. What's the game? Jason asked, figuring they could outrun this old coyote if it came down to it. Jason would wonder why he had thought of him that way, but he didn't have time to ponder it then. Choose your piece from my necklace, the old man said, slipping it off and laying it on the table, claw, talon, or fang. Then what? Moody asked, Kai moving behind him as if afraid to come too close. Then we start the game the old man said, smiling toothily. For an old man, he certainly had a lot of sharp teeth. Okay, Moody said, walking forward as Kai followed in his wake, I choose claw. Talon, said Kai, reaching out to touch it. Fang, said Jason, and as he put his hand out, he felt a sudden, violent shifting in his guts. He was shrinking, the world moving rapidly all around him. He was smaller, but also more than he was, and he was trapped. His legs scrabbled at the thing that held him, and he tore it to pieces as he freed himself. He heard a loud roar and something big rose up before him. The bear was massive, ragged bits of something hanging from him, and Jason was afraid that he would kill him before he could get fully free of his snare. Something screeched then, flying at the bear's face and attacking him. Jason saw blood run down the snout of the bear, and as it tried to get the bird, a large hawk, off its face, Jason circled and looked for an opening. He was low, on all fours, and he could smell the hot blood as it coursed down the bear's muzzle. Blood and meat and fear and desire mingled in him, and as something laughed, he turned and saw a large coyote sitting at the table. Its grin was huge, its snout longer than any snout had a right to be, and he was laughing in a strange half-animal-slash-half-man way. The hawk suddenly fell before Jason, twitching and gasping as it died, and he knew the time to strike was now. Jason leaped on the bear, its arms trying to crush him but not able to find purchase. He sank his teeth into the bear's throat, and for a moment he was afraid he wouldn't make it through all that thick fur. The bear tried to bring its claws to bear, but as the wolf worried at it with its fangs, he was rewarded with a mouthful of hot blood. The bear kept trying to rake him with its claws, but its movements were becoming less coordinated. When it fell, the whole room shook with the sound of its thunder, and Jason rolled off it as it lay still. Bravo, bravo, cried the coyote, clapping its paws together in celebration, well fought, young wolf, well fought. Jason took a step towards him, but suddenly he was falling. It was as if a whirlpool had opened up beneath him and he was being sucked into it. Jason thrashed and snarled, trying to get his balance, but he was powerless against the pull as it flung him down and into the depths of some strange and terrible abyss. He came to in the empty clearing where the house had been, 
and that was where he found his friends. Wiley rewound the tape, not quite sure what to make of this. So this strange man offered to play a game, and then he changed you three into animals. Jason nodded, looking like one of those birds that dip into a glass of water, I picked Fang, so I was the wolf. The game wasn't fair, we didn't know what we were doing, but I still killed Moody. I killed both of them because I had been the one to approach the house first. I killed them when I agreed to play the game. It's my fault, I'm a murderer. Wiley wasn't so sure, but it was hard to argue with the evidence. The video showed Jason dropping the camera and then suddenly there was a lot of snarling and screeching. Wiley heard the animals fighting, but he heard something else too. Something was laughing, really having a good belly chuckle, and it sounded like a hyena. He couldn't see it, it was all lost amongst the carpet, but suddenly that carpet had turned into grass, and the camera was lying outside in the midday sun. Someone got up, someone sobbed and moaned out in negation, and then they walked away. That was where the video ended. In the end, Jason was sent for psychiatric evaluation and the whole thing was chalked up to a drug-induced episode. Jason and his friends were drugged by an old man in the woods and while under the influence of an unknown substance, a substance that didn't show up on any toxicology screening, they killed each other. Blood was found on Jason, blood belonging to Marshall Moody, but blood from the fingernails of Moody was determined to belong to Kai Dillon, which really helped push the narrative that Detective Wiley was working with. He told the press to report an old man in the woods who was drugging people and pushed the stranger danger talks a little harder than usual that year on school visits. After that day, the tape he took from Jason Weeks was never seen again, but Wiley believed that the boys had run up against something they weren't prepared for. When John Makaro had led the extermination of the native people that dwelt on his land, he had angered something he wasn't prepared for either. Wiley's grandmother had liked to tell stories about Coyote, the trickster god, and how he could be as fierce as he was cunning when he needed to be. Wiley didn't think they would ever find an old man out there in the woods, but he didn't doubt others would find him. Coyote liked his games, especially when the players were people he saw as interlopers. Makaro House remained a town legend, and Wiley had little doubt that those foolish enough to enter would be presented with the same game these three boys had been given. Wiley shuddered to think how the next challenge might go when Coyote needed more amusement. Makaro House This is Jay, Moody, and Kai, and today we are searching for Makaro House.